What a great pleasure to be here with all of you today. And thank you very much, Petra, for the introduction and for your invitation uh, to join you in this effort. When I saw the title that um, Dr. Klinga asked me to present on, Current Concepts on the Diagnosis and Management of Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes, the International Guidelines, I sort of expected her to give me four hours. <laughs> um, because covering this material in 20 minutes is just really uh, not possible. Um, but fortunately, the resources are available for all of you to find this information uh, whenever you need it. So if you go to the Ehlers-Danlos Society website and under H, uh, EDS HSD info, you will see the information about the international classification here. And uh, all those 18 papers that Laura and Susan mentioned are available freely for all of you. And so the full range of the criteria, the diagnostic criteria, and the management guidelines are there online uh, for you to look at after, after this meeting. I'm going to do a quick run through, though. Uh, the classification of EDS types in 2017 included uh, these 13 uh, types, starting with the classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And the most common ones, which I'm going to emphasize a little bit today, are the classical, vascular, and hypermobile types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I will give you some more details about those. The rest of these fall under that category, the rare disorders. So when you look at the distribution of work that the committees um, put in, uh, Dr. Tinkle, Dr. Byers, and I each had were charged with one of those uh, disorders, and Dr. Malfait took on the remaining 10. So she really had some very, very heavy lifting to do in preparing that work. So the classical EDS, the major criteria are the skin hyperextensibility and hypertrophic, uh, atrophic scarring, and then the joint hypermobility. And the minor criteria, you can see the whole list here, but the takeaway here is in the yellow. So the clinical diagnosis for classical EDS uh, includes the major criteria number one, which is the skin hyperextensibility and atrophic scarring, plus either the joint hypermobility as defined by our hypermobility uh, working group, or three of the eight minor criteria on this list. And just some photos to illustrate the kind of skin hyperextensibility that we see in the classical type. This is extreme skin hyperextensibility and also extreme skin fragility. So um, people with classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome have uh, a tendency for their skin to tear. Really, if any, any minimal, minimal trauma can cause um, tearing of the skin in this disorder. And then the Biden score, uh, which as Laura mentioned, is what we are still using to define joint hypermobility because it is the only validated criteria that's published and well recognized and accepted at this time. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on, but this is a nine-point scale, and uh, we have now age-specific cutoffs for the diagnosis of generalized joint hypermobility using the Biden score. Now, the confirmation of classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is through molecular testing. We know that mutations in type 5 collagen cause the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and the two genes that encode type 5 collagen are Cal5A1 and Cal5A2. And so if you can find a pathogenic variant in Cal5A1 or Cal5A2, you, you confirm the diagnosis of classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. For the vascular type of uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, the major criteria are listed here. The major things that you need to know about the vascular uh, type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is that this is the type that we worry about the most. These are the patients at the gravest risk for mortality from arterial uh, dissection. 
and the rupture of hollow organs in the body, such as the GI tract and the uterus and uh, the bladder. So um, if we have a suspicion of this diagnosis, it's very, very important to establish the diagnosis. The minimal criteria suggestive for vascular EDS are a family history of the, of the disorder, the arterial rupture or dissection in individuals less than 40 years of age, an unexplained rupture of the sigmoid colon, and spontaneous pneumothorax. Dr. Byers and his committee did not give us um, minimal clinical criteria to establish a diagnosis because really the identification of a pathogenic variant in type 3 collagen, the gene encoding type 3 collagen, which is called 3A1, establishes a diagnosis of the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And if you think about the possibility of vascular EDS, really it sh this should be tested for. Now the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, according to the 2017 diagnostic criteria, there are three criteria that people need to meet in order to be diagnosed with hypermobile EDS. Criteria one is the generalized joint hypermobility. Criteria two includes the presence of two out of three options. One is a positive systemic score with at least five out of 12 systemic findings. Two is a positive family history, and three are the musculoskeletal complications of either recurrent joint dislocations, chronic pain, or pain in more than two uh, limbs for over three months. And so you need two out of these three options to meet criteria two. And criteria three is really our exclusionary criteria. We want to make sure that we have considered a very full and complete um, differential diagnosis. So you want to make sure that there's no unusual skin fragility that would point you to the classical type or other uh, rarer types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, the exclusion of other heritable and acquired connective tissue disorders, and also the exclusion of alternative diagnoses that may also include joint hypermobility, and that would include, include some of the myopathies, for example, that might present as uh, joint hypermobility. Now, this can be a difficult set of criteria to keep in your mind. I've been using it for a year and a half, and I still don't really have it completely in my head. So I rely very heavily on this diagnostic checklist which was developed by Brad Tinkle and is included on the Ehlers-Danlos uh, Society webpage, and I would encourage uh, all of you to take a look at it and use it because it really makes it very easy to, um, to just run down the checklist and uh, you can figure out at the bottom whether or not the person you're dealing with meets the diagnostic criteria for hypermobile EDS. As Laura mentioned, um, the committee that was looking at uh, the hypermobile type of EDS also came up with the hypermobility spectrum disorders and thinking about patients who have joint hypermobility but do not meet the HEDS diagnostic criteria. And um, Dr. Marco Castori from Italy really played a very key role in this uh, part of the effort, and he uh, has come up with a sort of way of thinking about um, joint hypermobility and the classification of joint hypermobility, where if you think about people who have joint hypermobility, it may be localized. It may be uh, so only involving one joint or a couple of joints in a single limb. It may be generalized, in other words, meeting the criteria, the Biden criteria for generalized joint hypermobility, or it may just be peripheral in the small joints of the hands and the, and the feet. So people might have asymptomatic joint hypermobility in any one of those categories. They may have a well-defined syndrome with joint hypermobility, like hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, or they may have symptomatic joint hypermobility, but they don't meet the diagnostic criteria for a syndrome. So that's sort of the framework for classifying 
join hypermobility as uh, Dr. Castori and the Committee on Hypermobility put it forward. So they um, came up with this sort of list of a spectrum of joint hypermobility, starting with the asymptomatic group. In other words, they're bendy, but it's not affecting their well-being. Okay, so they have no symptoms associated with it. So you can have asymptomatic generalized joint hypermobility, asymptomatic peripheral joint hypermobility, and asymptomatic localized joint hypermobility. Now, if the patients are symptomatic and associated with joint hypermobility, then you're in the hypermobility spectrum disorder category, and this may be generalized peripheral or localized hypermobility spectrum disorder, or you may have a historical hypermobility spectrum disorder. I was bendy when I was younger, but now I'm 65 years old, I'm stiff. That's hypermobility, uh, historical hypermobility spectrum disorder. And then at this end of the spectrum, at the very uh, extreme end of the spectrum, is the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. <coughs> okay have seven minutes for management. You know, <clears throat> at my church two weeks ago, the children's choir put on a play. It was called Fast Forward, the Old Testament in 10 minutes. And that's kind of what I feel like right now. All right, so <clears throat> because we don't have um, an underlying genetic mechanism for these conditions, we are limited to systematic, symptomatic management at this time. And so we need to be aware of what the spectrum of the symptoms are and understand that fully in order to be able to most completely take care of our patients. And this is a complex issue because multiple, multiple organ systems may be involved. Neurology and neurosurgery, gastro, cardiology, sleep, urogynecology, orthopedics, oral surgery and dentistry. So it takes a village. We need all of our colleagues to be aware and working together in order to optimize the care of patients with hypermobile EDS and the hypermobility spectrum disorders. So going back to the um, EDS website and the classification and our 18 papers, um, you have reports from the working groups, you have reports on assessing joint hypermobility and the classification of joint hypermobility, evidence-based rationale for PT, cardiovascular and autonomic dysfunction, the management of chronic fatigue and the GI involvement, orthopedic management, uh, the neurologic and uh, spinal manifestations, pain management oral and mandibular manifestations, the mast cell manifestations, and psychiatric and psychological manifestations. And we are going to hear today from our representatives of many of these areas. So um, we'll be hearing about pain management and many talks on the neurologic and spinal manifestations. We'll be hearing about mast cells from Dr. Maitland, um, and we'll be hearing about PT. So I think, you know, you're going to really get a taste for the full um, complexity of management for these patients, but I would really encourage you to take a look at these papers and um, incorporate the thoughts and recommendations there into your practice. So I, um, I actually did it in less than my time. So. Uh, I owe such a debt of gratitude to the Ehlers-Danlos Society, to Shane Robinson and Laura Bloom, who have supported so much of the work uh, over the last few years, and my colleagues, Dr. Francisca Malfate, Dr. Peter Byers, and Dr. Brad Tinkle, um, who made it possible to produce the consortium um, papers and the volume that was published last year in the American Journal of Medical Genetics and to Dr. Petra Klinger for her invitation and my patients and their families and to all of you for your attention. Thank you.